welcome to Garden Puerto Rico. Today is our third and last day of webinars. And we would like to once again, thank you for being here. If you have joined us before, if this is the first time that you uh, join us in our webinars, welcome. My name is Shirley and I am your hostess in this webinar series. Today's webinar series is titled Technology and the Challenge of Education. This webinar series takes a closer look at the importance of democratizing technological tools and the practical applications of technology in education. Computer vision is one of the most important subsets of machine learning, and it is a technology that powers, among many other things, augmented reality filters, for example. Um, for our first webinar, Mr. Pedro Cruz Rivera exemplifies no-code AR applications that make it easy for anyone to use machine learning in new ways. And Mr. Cruz is going to show us exactly how to get started. Another technological tool that is becoming more accessible to the general public is virtual reality. However, keeping up with, um, with it is difficult, especially for those with fewer resources. Jose David Torres Quiñones, from Social Key explores the notion that it is possible to reduce poverty and inequality gaps by making emerging technologies available to vulnerable communities. Learning how to navigate VR interfaces and applications might become a necessary tool to access high paying jobs in the future. And those who can't afford to become educated in these technologies today may be at a disadvantage tomorrow. The importance of education cannot be overstated and our last speaker, Jorge Valentine, understand this very, very well. He argues that education evolution is more evident through the past of time and technology. And his webinar is closely focused on the effort plays on technology, science, and innovation to lead the way in our quest for a digital world under, under avant-garde learning and teaching methods. We hope you have enjoyed our content these past few days, and we hope you enjoyed today's webinars as well. So without any further ado, allow me to introduce, properly introduce, Mr. Pedro Cruz. Pedro Cruz is a software engineer specialized in VR and AR, machine learning, and tech for good applications. Pedro, Pedro is a co-founder of Veo Veo Studios, a Puerto Rican VR AR studios creating VR sports games, and he's also a developer advocate in IBM, where he helps communities launch open source projects for disaster response. Thank you so much for being with us, Pedro. Whenever you're ready, the stage is all yours. All right, thank you so much for the introduction and the invitation. My name is Pedro Cruz, and today we're going to talk about artificial intelligence and augmented reality in the classroom. How can educators leverage this transformational tool uh, with their students? Let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, give you the presentation. All right. So a little bit about me, my name is Pedro Cruz. I'm a software engineer from Puerto Rico. I'm an educator and I use technology in creative ways. I love to experiment with artificial intelligence, generative art. And today I wanna to show a little bit of my personal experiments, give a little bit of history of artificial intelligence and also share a little bit of tips for you educators who want to integrate this technology in the classroom. So as I mentioned, we are gonna talk about a brief history about AI, the techniques of computer vision, augmented reality, my personal experiments with AI, and then uh, tools for educators and lessons learned. So artificial intelligence is a very broad field. It consists of a few main areas, such as machine learning, natural language processing, speech, expert systems, robotics, vision, and others. My favorite area is vision and robotics because that enables computers to be able to see and understand the world. And it's also the foundation for augmented reality. However, one of the most popular use cases of AI 
is natural language processing. We use this almost every single day uh, with Google Translate, being able to also um, make speech. So Siri, for example, uses natural language processing to understand your speech, but also to talk back to you. So that's called speech synthesis. In addition, we have expert systems, which gives us um, the power to combine human knowledge with AI knowledge. So imagine a doctor being able to diagnose cancer more efficiently in collaboration with machine learning. So they're going to be able to save a lot more lives faster with this technology. So we know that AI is not even 100 years old. This technology started out in the 50s and 60s. Alan Turing introduced the famous Turing test, which is a way of testing the machine's intelligence. And during the 50s, the golden age of AI began. The first chatbot was conceptualized in 1966. The first artificial neural networks were uh, created in the 70s. But in the 80s, we have an AI winter. Why? Because technology wasn't there yet. Computing power uh, was very expensive. So it took another decade before uh, we saw more innovation happen in this space. Once we had personal computers and even mobile computers uh, and more powerful systems, we were able to create a new generation of artificial intelligence. So deep learning initiated a renaissance in machine learning. And then during the early 2000s and 2010s, we had the rise of social media with now huge amounts of data that now a scientist, data scientists can use to train more effectively their models. So with this, we saw a famous chess masters get beaten by AI. And as well as AlphaGo, which is considered one of the most complicated games out there, was also uh, the, the top player beat it by AI. So what happens then when we have artificial intelligence faster and smarter than humans? I don't think they will replace us. I think the opposite. We will start to use and collaborate more and more with AI. Now, if you fast forward to today, what I'm most excited about is stuff like OpenAI, GPT-3, and their new codex. So for those who are not familiar with OpenAI and GPT-3, it's basically uh, an artificial intelligence that can generate very um, precise text. And it, and it can confuse people. Now imagine now articles that can be generated by an AI. We're going to need another level of technology to be able to validate that everything is written is true or check if it was co-authored by an AI. In addition to that, now we have things like codex where programmers can, in their text editor, come up with solutions generated by machine learning. So it's basically using all the posts and Stack Overflow forums and websites around the internet, like coding tutorials, and also GitHub. And imagine now that programmer, um, they won't get replaced by the AI, but they will be much more efficient because they don't have to look for Google or Stack Overflow for the answer of uh, what they're trying to program. They can literally in their text editor use it. So very exciting technology and we're just getting started. Now, one of my particular interests is genitive art. Generative art refers to any practice where the artist uses a computer program to make art. And this is a very uh, relatively new concept. We have in the early computing history, many pioneers like Vera Molnar. Vera Molnar is a French media artist of Hungarian origin. And she is widely considered to be one of the pioneers of computer art and generative art. And she is also one of the first women to use computers in her practice. Amazing. And this was in the late 60s and early 70s, and she's still alive today. We have Lydia Schwartz, another woman um, in this ecosystem, and she used photography to generate uh, art and computers. 
Linian is an American artist considered a pioneer in computer mediated art. And one of the first notable artists for basing almost her entire ovoir on computational media. Next up, we have George Nies. George Nies was a German academic who was a pioneer of computer art and generative graphics. You can actually look up of his uh, lectures online on YouTube. They're very inspiring. And in addition, we have Frieder Naik and so many others that do not fit in this presentation. He, will, he is a mathematician, computer scientist, and pioneer of computer art. He is best known internationally for his contributions to the earliest manifestations of computer art. So these art pieces were generated by a computer, but they were thought about and they were conceptualized by humans who are experimenting. And we can take this same knowledge into the classroom. So, if you fast forward to the 2000s, one of the most interesting generative art is when you combine artificial intelligence to create something like this. This is using uh, generated adversarial networks to make a dream-like, almost hallucinogenic uh, painting. You can use the style of one painting and apply it to another. We'll talk about this a little bit later. And there's definitely now a theme of generative art that is saved on the blockchain, on Ethereum blockchain and many others. You can make these tiny pixelated art, things like CryptoPunks, uh, art blocks, the Chromy Squiggles. Uh, this is a new generation and what I'm most excited about that students today, they can start learning about this and we'll have uh, a new ecosystem to share their art. So very exciting times. And as I said, we're just getting started with this. Now, one of the, the key areas that I focused my personal research on was computer vision. It basically enables computers to see. Let me give you an example. If we have an autonomous vehicle, like the one from Tesla, they have to be able to detect the roads, where the stop sign is, where are people, if they're crossing, at what velocity, other cars, bikes, dogs, so many things. 15 years ago, this was not possible with consumer or even enterprise technology. Now today, we have hundreds of thousands of cars, of autonomous vehicles on the road, and they're just getting better. So to enable these cars, these computers on wheels essentially to see, you need to build a very solid base of computer vision. And that will enable um, robotics to be able to move around their environment and interact with humans safely. So step, let's take a step back and talk about the main computer vision techniques. So then you have a solid foundation. So let's focus on the first picture, Seg semantic segmentation. What is that? Well, that one, that technique allows you to segment what is in the image. For example, you can see there that the grass is green. The cat is marked as yellow. There's a tree or there are trees in the background and there's a sky. But it doesn't really tell you where everything is located. It just uh, has an outline around the object or where it thinks the object is. It's just pixels. Next up, we have classification and localization. So in this ca case, uh, the algorithm was able to detect where the cat is and also say that it's a cat, right? So there's an object in here, it's a cat, and it's located in this part of the image. That's called object detection. If you combine that with multiple objects, you, you see um, on the right, you can detect dogs, cats, and, and so many more. As I was mentioning, Tesla and other autonomous vehicles companies, they need to be able to detect thousands of objects in the scene. So it can get very complex. And then lastly, we have image instance segmentation. So that gives us the ability to um, highlight the 
object in the scene versus segmentic segmentation is more about um, localizing the object in the scene. So for example, you wanna know where the object is and what is around the, the scene versus in instance segmentation, you're just trying to locate the object. So now that we have good foundation of the basic algorithms, how does this apply? So today we have VR and AR headsets. Uh, left side of the spectrum, we have real life. And then on the right side of the spectrum, we have completely virtual reality. And somewhere in the middle is where we will have, where we have augmented or even mixed reality. So with AR, you can use headsets, you can use um, phones, tablets, even your uh, laptop. Uh, but for virtual reality, you do need a headset. So computer vision is the foundation of these technologies. Because when you put, when someone puts on a headset, the headset needs to know if you're going to um, go against the wall or, or there's an, something unsafe in the environment, a dog, a cat. So imagine that this technology is a requirement for um, computer vision combined with augmented reality. So if you haven't seen this, this is one of the best headsets out there. It's uh, very costly, but um, one of the most professional, which is the Microsoft HoloLens. So this isn't something that you and me are gonna buy uh, to be able to see our text messages. This is more for enterprise use cases. And it's being heavily used today in stuff like engineering, architecture, and uh, in enterprise use cases. So what would it take to shrink that? Because if you look at this image, those headsets look really cool, but at the same time, there's a lot of limitations. It's heavy, it's expensive. The field of view, is small. So I was mentioning we have mobile devices, smart glasses, uh, and headsets. And we are very close to having AR glasses be available. In fact, I predict by 2023, you will see your first AR glasses at a store or you will see it online. Whether they're the best or not, we'll see. <laughs> but but this is just like seeing cell phones when the like the first cell phones came out. Then we had the iPhone. So we're going to see um, a lot of innovation in this space happen. So the first two images, those are just concepts um, from artists. And I think I feel like Apple is going to be a very prominent force in this industry. But on the on the lower half, we have on the left Facebook research glasses. So that they, they are conducting um, research in their campus live with this headset. And on the right, we have the Snapchat spectacles. They're also conducting research, uh, but they have already given the, the spectacles to about a few hundred creators around the world to start experimenting. So it's gonna be very interesting next year in 2022 and the year following, uh, who will be the first to launch uh, the first AR glasses that um, consumers will be able to, to buy, create content, um, and, you know, have fun. So that begs me a question. Like, this, all this technology is, is amazing. And I wonder how we can combine the uses of artificial intelligence, augmented reality, uh, with AI to create art. We've already seen how pioneers in the 60s and 70s started using and, and co-authoring art with machines. And I think it will be a trend to continue in the future. So as I mentioned before, we now have gener generative adversarial networks that can actually create art. This looks very complicated behind the scenes, uh, but let me show you an example of what is possible when you have that type of machine learning model. So here are a few examples of what GANs they can do. And they can do what's called style transfer. Take the style of one image and then apply that to another. So these are really good examples. And if we take a step back, how this works behind the scene is that you have on the left generator and on the right, the discriminator. 
And the, the, the reason why they're called adversarial networks is because they compete against each other uh, to determine what is fake data and what is real data. So long story short, this architecture enables this type of uh, image gen generation. And you know, after a few years of experimenting with AI, studying uh, machine learning techniques, I felt like I had <laughs> a, a handle of things. But in reality, I feel the same exact way as I got started. Uh, I still, there, there's still a lot of um, tooling to be matured. It's really hard to collect data. There's so many other issues. Um, so this is a very new field. No one is really considered an, an expert, although there are people who have decades of experience. Now, let me share a few of my personal experiments uh, with machine learning and art. So this was the first one. Shout out to Nicole Marrero, an artist from Puerto Rico, uh, who during the pandemic, she and her friends decided to recreate paintings from famous artists. And they would dress up as, uh, as the, the, the painter who's in the scene. And I decided to, to say, to take their images and apply style transfer. So then we can see that same type of art style in the photograph. So as you can see here, if we look at Nicole's hand, it looks very similar in style to um, this painting here by Vincent van Gogh. Um, but there's obviously not everything is the same. We see how the lighting effect here is affected. Uh, it's, it has like a tint, a, a blue tint. And that's, as you can see here, there was probably illumination. So this is not perfect. However, it's very powerful to be able to, to combine creativity with AI. Next up, I uh, started experimenting with Snapchat. Lens Studio, Snapchat's software to create lenses and effects is very powerful. And Snapchat has a long history of integrating machine learning in their applications. They're known as one of the best augmented reality platforms. Um, it's not only just sending disappearing messages. You can also create these amazing effects. And last year they opened up machine learning uh, abilities within their software, which allows you to apply models to live effects. So I took this painting by Romero Brito and I did style transfer, trained a model and applied that to a live lens inside of Snapchat. And that was the result. As you can see, uh, it's very funky. Uh, you can see my hand there, some sort of effects. You can see my dog and the living room. Uh, so very cool technology, but I kept experimenting and I got an even better result with the next painting. So this is a very famous painting, uh, The Scream, painted in 1893 by Edward Munch. And this, I was very fascinated to see how well this worked. As you can see in the painting, the sky is painted like red, orange colors. And when you look, when I went outside, it's actually matching it. Then the, the, the middle half of the image, you can see, I don't know what this is, whether a river, rose, um, ocean, or trees, but it's, it's actually applying that same dark hue to what's in uh, the foreground here. So very, very cool. You can actually try this out live in Snapchat right now, if you scan this code. Uh, but in addition to that, you can, with Snapchat, you can integrate effects. So for example, uh, she is opening her mouth. She's putting her hands on her face, just like in the painting. And it's basically stretching up her face. So these live effects are something that students will love because you can actually take machine learning and apply it in a creative way and something that they can share with others on social media. Then I got really interested because I saw an application on the App Store that can actually restore painting. And I was amazed by how well this works. So this is a, a photograph actually by, um, of Pedro Arbizu Campos and his wife, Laura Meneses. And as you can see, the picture 
is pixelated, it's worn out, but in the before and after, we can see the result after using um, AI. So you can see how it improves and smooths the face. Amazing, right? So imagine when in the future we can restore art, but that also puts the questions like what, what is the, the real art, right? So I, I, I feel like in the future we'll need ways to authenticate and improve um, digital painting. And I think that's where NFTs come in, but I digress. And then my final experiment, or one of the last ones, was using Art Breeder. Now, every single image and frame that you are seeing on the left here was generated. Uh, it is not real. It's based on hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of pictures. And I basically use GAN to generate this landscape. None of this exists before. So, this technology is going to open up a huge potential for artists around the world. I have gone from creating websites to using machine learning and augmented reality in the classroom. The more I learn, the more I realize that what we teach our students is a reflection of ourselves. How do you prepare students to be self-sufficient in the digital age? I have been thinking about the intersection of technology and learning for the for last few months. It's become a personal journey that I have begun to explore. I decided to create a series of block. Okay, let me just stop right there. <laughs> Everything that you just read here, apart from that, this sentence was generated by AI. Amazing, right? So this is something I experimented last year with and I continue to experiment today. If you don't believe me, check this out. If you go to this website, you're able to test out GPT-J, which is an open source version of GPT-3. This technology is going to transform writing. Because imagine now that students and, and teachers and everyone are going to be able to generate text that looks completely real, that, and can resonate with people that structurally sound, the grammar, everything. So what would, that, what would that change in our classrooms? I remember when I studied math in elementary, intermediate, and high school, my teachers would not allow me to use a calculator. Most of them wanted me to learn all the techniques you know, and, and, and be, be able to do everything on paper. And I saw the value with that. But as I moved on during college, the calculator was the, the preferred choice. Uh, so imagine a future where, yes, when you're an early age, you learn how to write grammar, maybe at an accelerated pace, but you will use these tools to write. And maybe even kids, you know, they will be writing at the collegiate level by the time they reach middle school, thanks to this technology. Now, that's a hot debate. I'll leave that for another day. But it's really amazing that today we have the power to generate these texts uh, basically for free. So what tools can educators use today? All of this was amazing, but I wanted to learn to be able to teach others. So my experimentation was one of the keys for my learning. Now, educators, whether you're a kindergarten teacher or a college professor, these following tools are stuff that I recommend you start testing. So then you can share this with your students. So first off, AI basics. I highly recommend uh, a platform that's called Machine Learning for Kids. It runs IBM Watson behind the scenes and you're able to use machine learning with Scratch. So for example, in this case, uh, you can see like there's a, a fan and a light. In this example, you, uh, a student can train a model to detect when the person writes fan on, fan off, turn on the fan, and so many other variables. Um, you know, there, there's so many ways that you can say turn on fan. So imagine trying to program that. We teach students that they can use AI to generate a possibilities, all the to be able to evaluate all the possibilities. 
of turning off and on the fan. So the same with the lamp. And as you can see here, when the person writes turn on the fan or something similar, it will enable the fan and make it turn. So if you ever have used Scratch before, this is really cool because you can directly integrate it uh, machine learning uh, to create experiments. And this is approachable for everyone, not just kids. And then a second really good example is by Google. It's called Teachable Machine. Now this one's similar, a little bit more lightweight, runs all in the browser, and you can do training um, right there live. So in this example, uh, this is uh, image recognition. And you can train when it detects a person, a dog, um, and highlight it when it's detected. So in addition to visuals, you can also do audio models. So I highly recommend that you check both of those out. Next one, if you are interested in teaching generative art, I recommend uh, two, processing and P5.js, uh, which is very similar, but it runs on JavaScript. These are the tools of modern generative arts. And to be honest, there's so many more. The point of generative art is to use a machine to uh, create something that we enjoy visually. Next up, for creative AI, I recommend these three platforms. We have Runway, which is probably like a Photoshop for AI. You can do a lot of things like um, using GPT uh, two or three, you can, uh, mask out images, you can improve, do upscaling. There, there's so many things within Runway that I think it's one of the best places to get started, uh, but it does require a little bit more of experience. Uh, Lens Studio can integrate machine learning models, uh, but you, it's also a platform dedicated to uh, augmented reality development for Snapchat. And then the third that I recommend you experiment with is Art Breeder. So this one is very fun because you're able to generate images that never have been <laughs> seen before. Uh, and you're able to breed images. So take two images and combine them. So very interesting and a lot of fun for everyone. Uh, next up, we have augmented reality. So as I mentioned, uh, machine learning is one of the core foundations to make augmented reality possible. But, you know, you do need tools to be able to integrate 3D assets, um, to do image detection and tracking and all these fancy uh, things. So I recommend you check out these tools. The easiest tools that are most appro approachable for beginners would be Lens Studio and Spark AR. Lens Studio is for Snapchat, Spark AR is for Instagram. And then the more professional tools like Unity and Unreal Engine. So in my past years of experience teaching students virtual and augmented reality in the classroom, I've learned a ton. But one of the most important things that I've learned now moving on to, to teaching artificial intelligence, machine learning in the classroom is to explore. That's one of the first things that you have to do when you are immersing yourself in a new technology. So when I first got started with programming uh, at the age of 11, one of the reasons why I wanted to learn how to program is to make a blog. And I um, learned how to code HTML, CSS, a little bit of PHP. Uh, and I immerse myself in that and I try to explore all the different subjects within uh, computing. So I would get a lot of books and immerse myself. In addition, I feel like this is the first step for any type of learning, right? So you, you need some time to explore a new technology, a new subject, um, and even consider exploring with others. Next up, we have Dream. Once you have explored all the different subjects went down that rabbit hole. The next step is to dream. Dream what can be possible. Don't think about all the limitations and what people say on the internet on what's not possible. 
Now's the moment to dream and to envision what the technology uh, and how the technology can be used. So this is one of the most important things when I first start um, with teaching students and they are learning how to use the technology once they have explored about it. We take some time to envision potential use cases, potential uh, problems that the production or the experience, the application might have. I feel like this is one of the most important steps. After you dream, after you had explored, the next step is to build. So I am a big proponent of building or learning by doing. So I don't have a formal education in, from college. I'm actually a self-taught developer. Building things was one of the best teachers that the method of building things really taught me um, how to learn how to program, how to program uh, or, or train machine learning models. Building, of course, also highlights where or what knowledge you are missing. So after exploring, dreaming, the next step is to build, iterate, and to create. And then finally, and this one I struggle a lot with, is sharing. All the different projects that I showed you, I, I personally don't share. And that has limited um, the influence that others have on my work. Now, one can argue, you know, you, you do need your alone time. But I have noticed that I go a lot further in my knowledge when I try to teach people, when I, try, when I share and try to, um, you know, teach my mom about artificial intelligence. Uh, this part is very important for students as well. Once they, they explore, dream, and build something, they have to share to be able to receive constructive feedback. And, you know, in addition to receiving constructive feedback, you'll be able to uh, engage with potential fans of your work. So there are a lot of people like you, like us, who love to use technology in artistic ways. So one of the best ways to learn is to share early and often. So with that said, I want to really encourage all educators around the world to incorporate the metaverse in their curriculum or even teach in the metaverse. Now, for those who have never heard of this term, the metaverse, let me just briefly say what it is. The metaverse is the collection of virtual worlds. Think about Minecraft, Roblox, and all these uh, games. Those are part of the metaverse. They're what I call meta spaces. They're virtual worlds within this whole metaverse. And kids, students, adults today spend a lot of time in virtual worlds. In fact, probably most elementary and intermediate, even high school students uh, use Minecraft, they use Roblox, they have uh, meetings in these virtual worlds. So I believe that educators play one of the most important roles in the metaverse. Once we have VR and AR headsets, this is going to accelerate because now you can collaborate within this virtual world. And I predict that most students will prefer to learn in a virtual world than on Zoom. It's a lot more interactive. So. Think about this moving forward while you're teaching this new generation of, of students. They will be metaverse native. The same way that you know millennials spend a, a lot of time on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, I believe the same thing will happen with metaverses. And it's, it, sh it shouldn't, we shouldn't stray away from that. I think um, people will have time for 
uh, so-called <laughs> real-world interactions or out, outside in the physical space. But a lot of what we do today, even like because of the pandemic has accelerated this, we, we are constantly in a virtual world. Twitter is in, in a way a, a metaverse. It's a virtual world. Uh, maybe it's not 3D, maybe it's not immersive, but we spend hours, days um, in these websites. So educators around the world, my message is start to incorporate these technologies. Artificial intelligence will play a huge role inside of the metaverse, whether it's um, AI to be able to customize the curriculum for each student, depending on their skill set and knowledge, or whether uh, teachers will start to incorporate artificial intelligence in them. So that's pretty much it for my presentation. Thank you so much. A big shout out to Ars Electronica and the Puerto Rico Science Research and Technology Trust for the invitation. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, please feel free to reach out if you have any questions uh, and good luck. See you in the metaverse. Thank you so much for your presentation, Pedro. That was really, that was really interesting. Absolutely fascinating, actually. Um, if anyone has any questions, please do contact Pedro directly. We will not have a live Q&A today, but you may contact Pedro at his email address or his Twitter account. This is Pedro's handle right here. So do contact him if you have any questions or any comments about his webinar. Up next, we're going to have Jose David Torres' um, webinar real, real soon about VR and social impact. Uh, we're going to get started at the hour. So I'll see you very, very soon.